El perro es carro de carro. O lleva de carro a carro. Okay. Porque lo haga. ¿Sí? No, que ella lo haga, es el carro de ella. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Hartford Charter Revision Commission on February 3rd. Recording in progress. I'm going to repeat myself one more time uh, just for the Hello. recording. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is James Wolf. I'd like okay. to call the meeting of the Charter Revision Commission meeting uh, to order on Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. And um, I will ask David Grant to call the roll. David. All right, why don't I call the roll? Um, James Wolf is here, Commissioner De Jesus. Here. Commissioner Gale. Here. Commissioner Aponte. Here. Commissioner Aralampalum. Commissioner Bonafonte. Here. Commissioner Gallen Clark. Present. Commissioner Harrington. Recording stopped. Commissioner Kennedy. Commissioner Kowalshin. Commissioner Medina. Here. Commissioner Jeter. <coughs> Commissioner Rubenstein. Here. Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Smith. Here. Recording in progress. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, Item number two, approval of the minutes from January 20th, 2022. Without objection, I'd like to table that item for our next meeting. Seeing none, um, we'll move on to the chairman's report. Um, per usual, we continue to watch the, uh, the COVID rates. Um, we're clearly not at the point where we can meet in person, um, but we aspire to do so as soon as possible. Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully, you know, within the next couple of months, we'll be able to meet in person. I know that at the legislature, they're thinking that sometime after March, uh, the public may be let into the building um, and, and things may, you know, start looking like they're coming back to normal. So uh, hopefully we can follow that timeline, but uh, we shall wait and see. Um, and that's it for the chairman's report. And now on to the, the panel discussion for this evening. Um, so we tonight have uh, members of the Court of Common Council here with us for a discussion on uh, administrative and professional structural issues, procedures, uh, both budget and ordinance, potential district uh, structure and composition for the city council, um, and also to weigh in on uh, issues of um, uh, appointing authority to boards and commissions uh, for the council. Um, and so we're going to go in order um, of the alphabetical order of the members that are here this evening. I did hear uh, a little bit before the meeting that a few uh, members of the council won't be able to make it tonight. Uh, and so we will provide them with an opportunity at our next meeting um, to weigh in and, and provide their thoughts um, at our panel discussion. We'll be having next meeting on council issues, which will include uh, folks from other municipalities that have um, different ways of operating their council, different ways of getting elected and, and being represented. Um, so I will give each member of council five to seven minutes to um, provide their thoughts. And then uh, commissioners, if you want to ask each member of council um, a question as they, you know, after they speak, uh, we'll open it up for questions. I do want 
all the commissioners to be cognizant though that if we have you know half an hour of questions for each council person this uh, meeting is going to go very long so please just be cognizant of that and try to keep your questions uh, limited to the extent that you can. Any questions from commissioners on the this agenda item? Okay. Um, without further ado, um, Mr. Majority Leader, you have the floor. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the invite uh, and to uh, the esteemed uh, commission members. Uh, good evening. It's always good to be before you. I uh, just wanted to really just add to uh, some of my commentary that I've uh, expressed before uh, since we have been undertaking this process. I'll start with uh, boards and commissions. Uh, I think that uh, since my time on council and since we've uh, gone through the uh, change from a strong council to a strong mayor form of government, I think um, as we have e evolved, it's very critical uh, that uh, you consider allowing council to have some sort of appointments uh, for boards and commissions uh, so that there can be some uh, type of um, equal sharing uh, power to a degree uh, to for, for those residents who are uh, would like to uh, serve their, uh, their city in various ways. We have a plethora of boards and commissions. And if you take a look at uh, the list, many are dormant uh, because of where the appointing uh, power uh, lies, which is mainly uh, with our chief uh, elected officer, uh, the mayor, um, it's not common. Uh, well, there are some that there, it it is common for to a degree uh, that uh, council has uh, some sort of appointing power uh, to certain certain boards of commission, such as the MDC, uh, to, and also to the Harvard School Building Committee. And so it's 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 really to me precedence has already been set. These are some of the um, boards and commissions I think uh, that are critical uh, that we should have share some type of appointing power and potentially uh, you all could should maybe consider adding these uh, into uh, the charter. Uh, the Police Accountability Review Board, uh, the Civilian Police Review Board uh, by way of ordinance, the amendment ordinance, we do have uh, some appointing power. Uh, the Human Relations Commission, uh, the Public Health and Addiction Commis Commission, which is dormant. Uh, the AIDS HIV Commission, which is dormant. And probably this is music to uh, my council colleagues' ears, uh, Chairwoman uh, Marilyn Rossetti of the Chair, Chair of the uh, Public Works, Parks and Recreation, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. Uh, so I think that these, for example, are ones that uh, you should consider. Uh, also, too, the structure of the council, uh, it's, I think, my mind has evolved as to how it should be. And I think that uh, for uh, more of a, a sharing purpose, purpose and really kind of pro pro uh, professionalizing uh, the office that uh, we should entertain uh, the notion of doing some sort of some sort of sharing power uh, with uh, council aides. Uh, I uh, I think that we could uh, really mirror what's going on and how it's worked working in the House of Representatives and the General Assembly. Also, too, uh, I'm a fan of how. Uh, the current structure is down uh, in the city of New Haven uh, for the Board of Alders, which probably some of you are uh, familiar with as well. Uh, so I really would like for you all to consider that option as well. Um, also, too, and I'm not sure how much time that I have left, uh, is the fact that um, how we uh, still go through our budget process, I think that it still should be extended uh, to allow uh, our uh, city council, my council colleagues, enough time to really um, undertake this process, which is our primary charge uh, uh, as a elected members citywide. And I think that, uh, you know, by way of us having a little bit more time, we, were, we are able to really dive into the budget, articulate that to uh, the public, and then really um, um, deliberate as to how we actually, uh, you know, will be able to increase our budget. Uh, and finally, I would say that I know that many people have, have been talking about the uh, maybe there is going to towards a district model or keeping it at large uh, hybrid model uh, that I'm kind of indifferent. Uh, we have to really take a look at how that actually would impact certain uh, neighborhoods uh, within our city. I know that the city of New uh, City, sorry, city of uh, uh, Waterbury, uh, I think has gone to a hybrid model, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the city of um, I know the city of New Britain has a hybrid model. 
Uh, and we know that New Haven has a, a district model, but that's really something I think that we should really hear from uh, the public uh, about as well to see if this is something that you know they would be open to because I really don't want uh, certain neighborhoods to be uh, disenfranchised uh, if we are looking to do a different model and that will be very impactful to them. Okay, thank you, Councilman Clark. Uh, questions? Commissioner Gallen Clark. Yes, good evening. Majority Leader Clark, I do have a couple questions for you. You mentioned four commissions and I was able to write down two. Would you just give me those four again, please? Uh, I saw, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Clark. Uh, it is uh, the Police Accountability Review Board, the Civilian Police Review Board, the Human Relations Commission, the Public Health and Addiction Commission, the AIDS HIV Commission, in the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. Okay, thank you. And I do have another question. And for the record, we're not related. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a comment, we actually heard it through a public comment early on. Actually, I'm looking at my notes from May. And the recommendation is that we consider not having the election for the city council at the same time that the mayor is elective and there was a number of reasons. What is your reaction to that? Uh, I think to in order to encourage uh, more voter turnout, I think it should be the opposite. I think the Board of Ed uh, should be uh, placed um, on the ballot at the same time with the mayor, the city council and the treasurer. Uh, you know, we have seen that it's going, It's we have a higher turnout uh, with uh, the mayor and the city council and the treasurer. And I think to encourage more, uh, more voter turnout, um, uh, that that uh, that should be considered. Okay. And my last question: How much more time do you think the council would need in order for them to do to do their deep dive into the budget? Um, I think that we had discussed possibly when the mayor provides the state of the city address for that uh, should be the start of the budget process or at least that, that month where we can actually receive the uh, mayor's uh, recommended budget a month early. Uh, I, I, and I know that there's been issues to discuss regarding the tax bill being sent out by a certain time. If we go beyond the May 31st deadline, I always said that, you know, and you know, Councilman Kennedy and uh, uh, De Jesus and uh, where is he at? I just saw him, Aponte, uh, that, you know, sometimes, you know, we have to adopt a budget that's more of a projection versus a reality because we don't know what the General Assembly is actually going to do when it's a long budget season. Uh, so I would recommend if it is possible under state statute to extend it into the month of June, I think that that should be um, taken to strong consideration. Thank you very much. That's the end of my questions. Hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Gallon clark Commissioner Kennedy. Um, good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Excuse me. You can tell where I've been all day. Um, PJ, uh, Councilman, um, I'm, I'm confused. And how would neighborhoods be disenfranchised if we went to a, some form of a district system, whether it be complete districts or hybrid? I think we just have to take a look at you know, take a look take a look at the numbers and see how that might be potentially Im impacted. After looking at the numbers, it may not be they may not be disenfranchised at all. I just think that you know this is something new, and we just need to see how those districts are going to be formed. And I guess my, next, my, my, my last question, because you talked about uh, the need to have the mayor with all the city elected officials. Is it not true that right now the mayor basically takes credit for everyone's election because he raises the money? And is it also not true that most some people feel somewhat obligated to the mayor because he's raising all this money and they get elected with it? Okay. Um, would it not be at least in some some ways, if you broke it out, if you had a hybrid system. So it would you be separated those who run at large from the mayor hmm. and they so raise their own money? Would they, would there in fact possibly be more independence? There could, or maybe I know Bridgeport uh, does a, does a model like that, that the mayor runs every four years and then the council, I believe, runs every two years. So it keeps it 
it keeps the mayor consistent, but the council, you know, would possibly change within the, the bid term. That might be something to, uh, to to think about as well. I mean, and why I've got you, how did you feel? Is it is it a good idea to actually have to have at least some retention on council um, in terms of staggering the terms? I mean, is, is yes. that? No, I think I think I think that that's 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 critical uh, because when we came in, it was a it was a basically a new council. And you had those that have been there, uh, you know, the institutional knowledge went out and then, but, you know, we did have some that were familiar with operations of City Hall. So, but I think that it, that is something to really strongly consider uh, mm -hmm. if one day there happens to be a municipal election and you have a completely uh, different council and may, you might have a person that wins, uh, wins the mayor's race that is completely, I will say, foreign to, to uh, city government. And so you will have an all slate a new slate of uh, people uh, who are new to city government, which, you know, could have some type of impact. And not, not to put you on the spot, but if, are you, not, you're not, are you, you, don't, you don't have strong feelings about a hybrid council district and at large one way or the other, and would it be okay to separate their elections? You have districts for your terms, but districts, you know, uh, uh, for whatever, you know, for four years, and then two years later, have the at large, and then that way it's a rotation. Um, you, you never lose the complete council at one time. Right. No, I I have actually, to be honest with you, went back and forth as to whether at large should should remain or entertain some type of uh, hybrid. I, and I would say um, a hybrid would be uh, would be my uh, highest, highest priority after, you know, if if the will uh, would not to go to at large. I think I think going to our all district might be something less than, uh, you know, something less impactful, but maybe a hybrid to keep that consistency, uh, such as what New Britain does, uh, might, might work. Okay. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Any other, any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Rubenstein, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Majority Leader. Good evening, Commissioner. I, uh, heard your, heard you mention uh, about the hybrid, and I certainly heard your interplay uh, with uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Um, wouldn't you agree? I only have one question at this point. Wouldn't you agree that uh, if, there, if the will of the commission is to go with a hybrid of, of various numbers, um, that there should be a uh, mention in the charter uh, relative to uh, an apportionment committee? Because if you're going to go to at least part districts, there has to be some entity that's going to apportion uh, the districts. And those apportionees hopefully can make sure that no particular ethnic or racial group is uh, left out of the picture. Yes. I would Thank be you. open to that. Thank you. Any other questions for the majority leader? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Feel free to hang out uh, and hang out. watch or, or watch at home on Facebook, <laughs> Zoom, however you want to do it. Uh, but thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And grab some popcorn. <laughs> I got to pop some for my son. He's been wanting to. <laughs> Steve, do you have a comment? I just wanted to say one thing uh, and thank you to the council members for being here tonight. Um, that it would be useful even for those of you who are here tonight to join us in two weeks because um, do you mind, Mr. Chair, if I just talk about the meeting and what kind of governments are going to be represented there and it might be useful for them to see this? We, uh, we've, the, I've had some conversations with the members of council, but I think okay. uh, it'd be helpful know, but... for commissioners and uh, the public as well. So feel free to go ahead. I, I'll talk very briefly. Um, we're going to have um, somebody from the New Haven a Board of Aldermen Legislative Services Office to talk not only about the district system, but about the Office of Legislative Services. We're going to have the president of the Hamden Legislative Council, um, Dominique Baez, to come up and talk about the hybrid model that exists in, um, in Hamden. Uh, Paul Pernaruski, the president of the Waterbury Board of Aldermen, is going to speak about moving, as Hartford you know, is right now at large, moving from an at-large system to a pure district system. Uh, and he can talk about 
how the board is operated. He's been board president for 18 years. So he can talk about um, how the board is operated under two different systems. Um, Tom Livingston, the president of the Norwalk Common Council uh, is, will be talking about their hybrid system and also about their unique staffing system. They have kind of an interesting staffing system that I was not aware of. Uh, and Gina Serra, the majority leader of the Middletown Common Council, um, which is an at-large body. I, I worked with them last year. They made a decision to retain the at-large system. So I thought it would be interesting to have people from a variety of different systems talking about where they've gone, where they've come from, where they've stayed and how they operate. Um, I have also, uh, I don't have a response yet, but I'm, I have somebody from Danbury, which has a hybrid system uh, and have invited them as well. And I think it would be very useful for people to, uh, to tune in, uh, to listen to them because I think they, they, it'll be very interesting testimony. Sorry, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Steve. All right, we'll move next to Councilman Gale with his council hat on. Uh, Councilman, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Um, I'll speak about three things, boards and commissions, um, professionalizing the office and um, the election of council. On boards and commissions, I don't have a strong feeling that council needs a voice um, based on my own experience. Uh, anybody that uh, I've uh, had an interest in having appointed or has come to me with an interest in being appointed where we've then referred to the mayor's office, this has not been an issue. Uh, people have got appointed. And I would just note um, that one of, the, one of the, the clear responsibilities that council does have right now to a point that uh, my colleague, uh, Councilman Clark mentioned, which is the school building committee, we totally failed. I've been on council for six years and we've only appointed one person when we have three appointments. So it's, uh, it doesn't sound to me like council has been chomping at the bit to, uh, to get its appointments made. Um, but anyway, as I said, I don't, I just, I don't really have strong feelings uh, about that. It doesn't seem to me it's broken, needs to be fixed. Uh, professionalizing the office when we came into office, and by the way, I don't, uh, former Councilman Kennedy, I don't have a problem with a clean sweep. Um, I, I don't need an institutional knowledge uh, base. Uh, we had a clean sweep when we came into office, and the former council did leave us with uh, their concerns about professionalizing the office. They had wanted to professionalize the office, apparently. They left us some pretty detailed uh, plans. We never adopted them. I am in favor of professionalizing the office. I want to hear what New Haven does. Um, I don't, I've never been a fan of each council person having their own aid. Um, while that's helpful for council people, it's not great for uh, efficiency and administration. I think we would be much, all of us council people would be more efficient um, and, uh, and accomplish more if we had uh, a more professional office that we could rely on at times. Uh, so the third thing, actually comes back to the first thing that I said to this commission. I think we had our first or second meeting, we were asked what we thought we would want to accomplish in charter revision. And I said that my, my highest priority was doing something if we could to increase voter participation. I think voter participation in Hartford is horrible. Um, and uh, the one thing I heard, I, I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Mednick, I think you brought these uh, people to us. We had other people come and talk about voter participation. And the two takeaways that I took from those comments were that you get more voter participation when you have district elections and you get more voter participation when you have nonpartisan elections. Uh, I mean, I know, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as a radical here. Uh, we probably don't have authority from the state legislature to have nonpartisan elections. Nonetheless, you're never going to get it if you don't ask for it. Um, uh, my feeling is um, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to go to full district elections, not necessarily hybrid, uh, because it sounds to me like that will get more voter participation out of each individual district. And I think, you know, part of the city up into nine districts, um, everybody gets representation uh, out of their district, more representation than they get today at large. There are plenty of neighborhoods in Hartford today that have uh, nobody on council that comes from that neighborhood. Uh, even though we're all supposed to represent the entire city, that's not always necessarily the case. Um, and then the nonpartisan aspect of it, I think, would just, you know, generate more, um, more involvement. Right now, it's really the Democratic Party 
is where all the action is. They, when the Democratic Party has a primary, uh, six against six, uh, that's really determining uh, what the next council is going to look like. Uh, you know, the minority party there, you know, we go out there, I'm, I have to consider myself at this point a minority party. You know, we go out there for the scraps. But, you know, the real action is in that Democratic primary. And, uh, you know, a nonpartisan to me would would uh, create more action. It just seems to me. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilman. Any questions for Councilman Gale? Yes. Commissioner Rubenstein. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Councilman. Um, I was intrigued by uh, your comments relative to district elections. How many district elections do you foresee which will increase voter turnout? And don't you agree with me that in order to have nonpartisan elections in Hartford, it would require legislation at the legislature? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I have to agree with you or disagree with you. I mean, I think it's a matter of fact whether we whether we have the authority or we don't. Um, as I said, I, I suspect we don't have the authority, but if you don't ask for it, you're never going to get the authority. So I'm not that it, that alone would not dissuade me from uh, lobbying for nonpartisan elections. I mean, they have it in many places around the country now. Uh, there seems to be a trend uh, going in this direction. Uh, and, you know. I'm just as I'm, I'm in favor of being ahead of the, the trend and not being the last one to join, you know, to get on the train. Um, uh, in terms of the districts, I'll, I'll wait to hear from New Haven. They seem to have a lot of districts that that, that seems to me to be almost overkill. Uh, we have nine council persons. I'm comfortable with that with that number. I, I don't have a problem if we carved Hartford up into nine districts. Thank you. Any other questions for Councilman Gale? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Councilman Gale. We'll now move on to Councilwoman Hercules. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, my first time being before this body. I'm just going to make my comments somewhat brief and um, maybe a little bit more broad maybe not too specific. Um, for you know, someone who is new um, to city council, when we envision a legislative body and a political process that is both welcoming, inclusive, and where those who may not be part of the establishment can have a voice and a meaningful opportunity to help lead the city, we ask ourselves what kind of changes to the charter will help support that vision. How do we implement a more responsive and more engaged governance here in Hartford? Um, we've heard about the idea of a hybrid system, and that to me does seem to be one way to achieve that, where we would have some at-large council members, as well as some members elected based on districts. I think in addition to increasing voter um, participation and turnout, this also increases accessibility to your elected official who you would see more in your local community, in your neighborhood. Um, and we also want to ensure whatever changes we make that minority party representation is preserved. Um, we talked a little bit about commissions as well. And I, I do feel that commissions are a great way to engage more residents and achieve a greater representation from across the city. We can seek insight from some of our youngest members of the community on commissions and people who may have different ideas and out of the box thinking. The legislative body as a more diverse and reflective representation of the community would be a great place to shift the appointing power to for commissions. Again, some of the guiding questions I believe that are important are asking how we can engage more residents, ensure a broader um, representation across the city, and of course, preserve minority party representation as a way to always lift up the voices of those who are most marginalized in our community. Voices that can propose different ideas that are actionable, realistic, and will benefit the community over the long term. Whatever changes we make, we want those changes to reflect our values as a city that is welcoming, that is transformative, and that really seeks input from more than just the <laughs> those who 
speak the loudest. We want to really um, seek input from everyone and how do we really engage people at um, the local level. I think also we have to recognize that there are many barriers that prevent people from um, being engaged at the local level. And we talked a little bit about that this evening with respect to voter participation. So how do we um, make a real concerted effort to remove some of those barriers and welcome and encourage the next generation of leaders because this is forward and being proactive and thinking about these changes that that you all are going to be undertaking. Um, another thing that we talked briefly about in, in, in the terms of professionalizing the office a bit is thinking about how, even though for myself, you know, we're all part-time um, council folks and we all have our full-time professions, and this really lends itself to um, selecting those who have who can afford to do that. And so we are missing a great subsection of the community and folks who couldn't afford to take on a council position part-time because their full-time job doesn't allow them to do that. So possibly thinking about making council seats full-time and that may encourage other members from different socioeconomic um, um, you know, subsets in our community to be able to actually run for office and be part of the political process. So again, thank you for your diligence in um, doing this complex and difficult, but very important work. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any questions for Councilwoman Hercules? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you again, Councilwoman. And we'll move on to Councilman Mitchum. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we, it looks like we do have a question. Um, I jumped Collins on Fire. really late. I thought about this, Councilwoman Hercules. My experience um, in working with Councilman Mitchum, and I probably mess up your name every time, and Councilwoman Bermudez has been that they've been very vocal at many times um, and being the unpopular ones speaking up on some causes like for instance, what's, what was happening um, previously at the police department and things like that. How, and maybe this is a question I should be asking you privately, but how do you, to, how do you anticipate carrying on that legacy about being vocal about unpopular issues? Yeah, I, I see that as my role. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Josh and Wilda um, selected me because I have not been a stranger to uh, speaking up about um, things that may not be popular, but still doing it in a diplomatic way where it's not offensive. But I think that it's important, especially given where I reside in Asylum Hill and the people I represent in my day to day as a criminal defense attorney. That I'm able to bring, I apologize if it keeps calling me, even though I keep talking, and um, I'm able to bring that voice to the forefront. I think that's part of my role and responsibility, and um, I don't shy away from those opportunities um, to do so when it's necessary. Thank you so much. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, Councilman Mishtam, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And uh, I never correct anyone, but it's Mictum, rhymes with victim. I'll put it out there. Um, I, I, um, I guess with the, before I even start on what I most want to focus on, I just think it's important to remember that the work you all are doing is it's I think it's important and I'm sure you all talk about this but to separate it from who's on council now or who's mayor now um like I, I heard councilman Gale mention that uh he doesn't have a lot of concern with the appointment power because the mayor is very responsive to the council's wishes and that's true right like that hasn't that hasn't been a, a problem but we are right this this is the work of making a constitution which is supposed to not just work with the best of us, but protect us from the worst of us. Uh, so I, I say that as a, as a preface, because I do want to focus on the importance of minority representation and, and keeping in mind that it's structural, right? That like, no matter how much any of us likes who are, who's in the majority right now or respects the work they do or, or, even likes the, the DTC system for choosing them, the idea is to insulate the city against a worse set of folks than we have right now, right? So I think that is really one of the places where having minority representation is, is fundamental, right? Because you have folks who don't 
I, I, former Councilman Kennedy, Commissioner Kennedy mentioned this, don't have, they're not, they don't owe anything to the mayor or to the Democratic Town Committee. So it's a little easier in those circumstances to raise a fuss. Now that fuss may not result in a different vote, but I, I can think of a number of occasions just in my two years on council uh, with Councilwoman Bermudez where we were at least able to put things front and center, right? We were able to make sure that some things got covered by the press, that that everyone had to address them head on, right? Because like we all know this, that there's not a lot of participation from the public, not just in voting, but I don't think a ton of people are turning tuning into to HPA TV you know, to, to watch our meetings and God bless them because, you know, some of these meetings drag, but I think it's important to have some voices who come from outside, whatever the dominant system is to raise those issues, to give more people a chance to see what's going on. So we don't get too chummy among us council. people. I also think that minority representation brings, you know, it's not just dissent. It's not just having a situation where a couple people vote no, it's having a situation where there's someone there to offer an alternative, right? So it's not simply that, well, the mayor proposed a budget and the budget passed with seven of nine or six of nine. It's that there were actually two or maybe three options on the table. There were, there were possibilities so that if someone is watching a regular voter, it's not just that it was approved. They can say to someone in the majority, well, you turned down another option. You had something in front of you and, and you said no. And that's just, that's a more robust uh, democracy. I would also, I would say that, you know, I think all of us in Hartford, I certainly, we, we are sensitive to a criticism that is leveled at us sometimes by, by the suburbs that it's a sort of a chummy, insular, uh, backroom dealing kind of situation. And we do ourselves a service if we make sure that outside voices are inside, have have a shot at being heard, at, at raising a fuss. Obviously, I'm bringing all this up because we talked about the district system, right? And if we go to the district system, the state minority representation law doesn't apply. Now, if we go to the hybrid system, uh, I know Steve will correct me if I'm wrong, it only applies to the hybrid seats. So I would just ask all of you on this front <clears throat> to keep in mind that we could make our own minority representation rule regardless, right? We could, we could have, uh, you know, we could have five districts and four at large of whom two are minority, right? Like we could, we could make it as we wish. You could make it as you wish. So not to simply to be bound by the idea that either we have it because the state statute gives it to us or we don't, but to keep that in mind. And also, frankly, if we adopt our own rule, I think it sends a message to, to other municipalities, to the state about a shared concern in transparency, in shared governance. Um, I think I'm probably close to time. I could go on and on. This is what I do for a living, but I want to... Uh, I do just want to also give a thumbs up to what Councilwoman Hercules said, that we should really think about the fact that every member of council owns their own home, right? We have resources that let us do this. And it would be amazing if someone who's working at Family Dollar or driving for Uber, you know, who has fewer resources could say, if I run and I'm elected, I can put that behind me and do this other job. And yes, it would cost a little more to make us full time, but... I think the count, whole council budget with benefits and everything is under a million dollars. If we push that up to 3 million in a what, $560 million budget, I would suggest that's a good trade-off in terms of responsiveness and representation. But I'll leave it at that and y'all can ask me questions if you like. All right, thank you, Councilman Nickton. Do we have any questions for the councilman? So Commissioner Dean Medina had his hand up uh, yeah, for uh, for Councilman Mitchum. Um, just so I understand, right? Uh, you're, you're in in a, in a system where we went to a hybrid model with at large seats and in district seats. What you're saying is that specifically, we probably want to think about making those at large seats um, inclusive of minority representation and written and have that written in the charter. Am I understanding right? Right. Because, for example, suppose that we kept nine seats overall and we made six districts 
and three at large. If we did nothing, only one of those at large seats would be guaranteed for a minority party. So then we, instead of having three and six, we'd have one and eight. But if we change the charter, we could have all the at large seats be minority seats, or we could have four at large seats of which three were minority. I mean, we could do whatever we want. So that is what I'm saying. We should consider making our own rule to to just not worry about the state statute. Got it. And then and I, I'm not a, I'm not a numbers person, so you have to help me. Is there any concern that you would have in a potential expansion of the council because it may dilute minority representation? I mean, I would say I don't have any concern with an expansion of the council per se, right? I, I think. Um, I think it was also Councilman Kennedy who said that, like, you know, if you, maybe also Councilman Clark, you know, if you have a district, you have someone to go to, there's a sense that they're accessible. If you have more districts, there's fewer people going to the same person. That seems like that's more accountability. I would just say that whatever we do with expanding the council uh, or going to some hybrid system, that we make adjustments to preserve minority representation. So if we went to 30. I don't think we're really going to go to 30. But if we went to 30, we could still set aside 10, right? So we still have a third minority, whatever the state statute says. We could do it in the charter. Got it. And then my uh, my last question is in reference to uh, your experiencing your, your experience as a council person within a minority party and your interaction with the majority party. Are there any protections that we should be thinking about uh, preserving in the charter that ensures you're on, if not equal, at least a player playing field, uh, a fair playing field as it comes to consideration of policies, budget, all that other stuff? That's a really good question. It's And it's hard. I mean, I think there's a, many ways we could make it a little better for minority parties in terms of say so i think we have a pretty fair shake in terms of having our voices heard uh i think it i have been frustrated at times with the majority's use of procedural rules to end debate um i don't know if it's really if that's the level of granularity that you all wait want to wade into but i think it wouldn't hurt to think about how debate gets cut off uh and and to maybe change some of those rules because by and large, I think that the majority has let me run at the mouth, you know, graciously. But I see Councilwoman Rossetti nodding and smiling. Uh, but there have been occasions when I feel like I had just a little more to say and they, they quelch debate. So something to consider. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Councilman Gale. You're muted, Councilman. You're on mute. This there is you. great. I get both roles tonight. So, um, Councilman Mictum, you speak very passionately about minority representation. Uh, but I, I must say that uh, minority representation to me is about the most undemocratic uh, feature of our otherwise democratic system. I, I was always appalled when uh, we had three Republicans who were elected year after year after year in Hartford when they represented about 5% of the uh, registered voters. Now, my understanding is that New Haven uh, does not have minority representation that because they have the district system of uh, 22 aldermen, uh, that there is no minority representation. So my question to you is, do you have some feeling that somehow we function better than New Haven? or that New Haven could function even better if they had minority representation? You, you think we're doing a much better job than New Haven in representing our constituents at this point? Um, well, I wanna start, I wanna push back a little on the question of being undemocratic only like, yes, purely theocrat theoretically it's undemocratic, but we need to take a step back and say that even our highest vote getter on council got, you know, maybe three or 4% of registered voters. So in some sense, when we're at this level of low participation and when the, as I think you yourself pointed out, when the, when the Democratic Party, so, you know, that's where the action is. They so wholly control the, the debate and the, the spectrum. When that's the case, it, none of it is democratic, right? I mean, none of us can claim a broad mandate when most folks don't vote. So in that sense, Given those realities, I think that the minority representation statute or whatever provisions we might have 
does have a valuable, and I would argue sort of democratic um, purpose. Now, in the sense that it gives a space for dissenting voices that might otherwise be quieted. Um, now, to your second question, does New Haven function better than us <laughs> or worse? Uh, you know, the Hartford chauvinist in, one, in me wants to say, of course, we are better in all respects. But realistically, I mean, it's hard to say. I, I can't say that I know the answer. I will say that the idea of nonpartisan, I like, you know, you raised the question of perhaps nonpartisan elections. And that is another, to me, intriguing solution to the problem of uh, one party that has so has historically so occupied the debate that it's difficult for other voices to get in. Well, thank you. Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, thank you to the chair. Uh, councilman, um, I'm going to try to... Uh, Things I think I think are, are possible. Um, we can't do the uh, I mean the legislature. I, I, mean, I agree with Councilman Gale. I mean, not nonpartisan has some appeal that's beyond the scope of the Charter Revision Commission. And even if you ask for it and they do nothing, then you, your time here is not exactly well spent. Um, in, in my in one man's view. However, if you kept your district of uh, your at large seats at nine and you went to six districts, for example, and went to that 15th. And you kept your minority representation at three. Would that offend you? Well, offend is a strong word. It wouldn't offend wow. me. I, I like the idea of keeping a third. So if we had 15, I think it would be worthwhile to keep five minority seats. Um, right? Yeah. Five, five seats set aside for minorities. And I suppose there's probably some kind of ranked choice way that you could mix districts in at large in a way that uh, allowed people to run either for district or for at large, especially as you had mentioned, if those were staggered, that's another way that you could sort of set that up. I do think a third, having a third set aside for minority parties or minority candidates, right? They could be from no party has value. Again, the, the value of trying to go to the district is trying to make it so that people can be competitive with the democratic. I mean, look, let's just put, you know, I have been on both winning and losing sides of the democratic primary. Um, it is very difficult to take on the party, grant you. Um, lost my last, last election by 63 votes, and that was a challenge. But when looking at the overall you know, scheme, if you make it small enough in, in a small enough district, for example, a good friend of mine, Lou Watkins, had we had a district for you know, that, section of North, that section of North Hartford, Lou would have never lost an election. I don't care who you had to put up there. It wouldn't have mattered. And he could have been any party, Republican, working families. It wouldn't have mattered. Lou wouldn't have lost. And I guess the idea behind a district, in my opinion, and I don't know if you share this, I guess that's the question. If the district is small enough to make it a competitive you know, race where the weight of the party is kind of somewhat taken away, would that it, uh, alleviate some of your concerns? Um about because I don't know how you how you do a, if you do a hybrid system how you can guarantee a third of all seats go to a minority party and that's kind of what I'm struggling with but if you make the districts small enough regardless of party independent a Hartford party a Connecticut party I mean they should be able to be somewhat competitive regardless of, of uh, the endorsement of, or non-endorsement of the Democratic Party oh for sure I mean I think uh, no question right the smaller the district Yes, the, the more chance I think that anyone has a shot, you know, unfortunately not me because uh, Raul de Jesus lives around the corner from me, so he would beat me every time. But um, no, I, I, I fully agree that I think if the if the districts are small enough, and I don't know what that smallness is, it, sure. it takes some of the, the sting out of not as large of minority representation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for answering the question. I appreciate your time. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Rubenstein. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Councilman. Uh, Good evening, I, sir. I listen with, with fascination, and I do have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, you mentioned um, a possibility of a hybrid among, amongst the uh, 10 and 5 model. Uh, I do 
believe, though, that you're aware that the statute relative to minority representation says that any at large uh, uh, folks running would, would, would have to have a third. So a third of five is a little bit cumbersome. Would you be more as amenable perhaps to a nine and six? Uh, therefore, it would guarantee two and it wouldn't be quite so uh, uh, cumbersome. I guess what I was saying is that we could go to a system where, and, and Steve will again correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of the interplay between the state statute and the charter. But if the state statute says you have to have at least a third of at large seats for a minority party, but by charter we reserve more, I would assume that we're in the clear. So in other words, we could have, say, nine districts, six at large, and of the six at large, five are just reserved for, for minority parties by, by charter, right? So I would say if we can endeavor to keep that balance, however we break up districts and at large, to me, that's the best option. Yes, and, and as you spoke before, you said that the chances for minority representation really rest with smaller congruent uh, districts. So uh, while some mentioned nine and, and the present makeup is nine, I, I take it then that you would be more interested in more council people, perhaps 15 or even uh, more. Am I, am I correct? I think, I think that's right. Within reason, right? I mean, I think I don't, we want, you don't want like, you know, the Imperial Senate from Star Wars, where it's a vast hall of representatives. I, I think also we should think, you all should think about how the districts are drawn. We tend to assume that like a neighborhood is a district and it, it doesn't have to be thus, right? And and I think if, if we make the neighborhoods the district, we reinforce sort of old North End, South End, um, African-American, Latinx rivalries, we could draw districts that cut across those old lines, right? Like we could have a district that has Asylum Hill and Frog Hollow and another district that cuts down from Blue Hills into the West End. So we could be creative in our district drawing specifically to create new, to force new coalitions. My, and my last, thank you, that was a good answer. My last question is, is this, I listened with um, fascination about um, making the council full-time. Um, my question is, A, are you aware that there are uh, other towns and cities in Connecticut where the council uh, is full-time? And uh, B, uh, and, I, and I hope some of the um, ex-council people, and in addition, Councilman Gale, uh, jump in on this. Is there enough work uh, in the council to make uh, uh, having a full-time council uh, meritorious? So I don't know that there are any other municipalities in the state that have full-time councils. Um, I, the, the big cities do not. Um, I don't know if some, it would be sort of odd if very small towns did, but I, I do think, and I can only speak to my, how I have operated on council, um, I depend heavily on because I have a day job. And if I didn't have a day job, I, I would fill that time with stuff. I feel like there is there is work and there are ideas uh, to be pursued. I mean, I, I suspect all my colleagues would agree that, you know, we talk amongst ourselves like, man, that's a good idea. I'd like to do more research. But we, you know, we don't have the time. And I, I mean, I would also just like to be out, uh, you know, talking to more, I think if we were full time, we would also increase participation of voters. We, if we, if our only job were to be out talking to folks, engaging them, we would engage them and we would have higher uh, voter participation. So I think the work could be there. You know, actually, if I could add one thing, I think we would shift the balance of power away from the mayor and to council that way, even with no change in the, in the structure. Just because the mayor has is full time and has a competent full time staff, and we are part time, and I think we could balance ourselves out better if we were also full time. Thank you, Commissioner Medina, for the second time. Sorry, this uh, this is a question for Attorney Mendick. Just at a, a point of clarification, so I understand the process. 
if our charter uh, revision were uh, to move to any form of a district uh, setup, would this charter commission be drawing the lines or would that go, would the drawing of the lines go to the legislative body to determine? Yeah, um, Bruce mentioned it, Commissioner um, uh, Rubenstein mentioned it earlier. We would have to have a reapportionment structure added to the charter. Ultimately, the legislative body would approve the lines in the uh, in the districts. Um, it's the way it's done in most municipalities. Okay, Commissioner Gallon Clark. Thank you, Chair. Through you, I, I have a question for Attorney Metnick. So I'm hearing, I saw you shaking your head, no, that we have no best practices in the state of Connecticut for full-time council people Well, that you're aware of? Not a function of best practices, there are none. There are none at all. There are none at all. Even uh, the towns, um, and I thought that uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Council Member uh, Mick, Mickton was, uh, was uh, correct in stating the big cities do not. Uh, I started thinking whether some of the board of selectmen towns might, and they don't, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, if there's one that exists, I do not know about. Them. Are you aware of any nationally? Well, some of the big cities, Detroit, uh, I think New York City's council is a full-time council. I don't know about Boston. I've never uh, studied it, but I do. I happen to know the, uh, some of them because I've done business in some of those communities, and they do have full-time full-time councils in, the, in most of the major cities have full-time councils. So Philadelphia as well, Baltimore. Philadelphia, yeah. okay. Yeah. This is a question to the chair then. Uh, is it possible since we're in this virtual community that we could actually talk to one or two of those cities and hear the pros and cons from them, what's working, what's not? You're muted, um, chair. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's certainly a possibility that we can explore, yes. I have contacts in some of the cities uh, uh, that um, you're talking about. I'll talk to the chair about following up. I actually, I also know some council members who are full-time in some of those places, so I'll also try to make that connect. Okay. Any other questions for Councilman McDonald? Seeing none, we will move on to Councilwoman Rossetti. Councilwoman. Thank you all, by the way. Thank you. Good evening. How are you all? Um, first off, I want to I want to thank you for taking on such a difficult and I'm sure a stressful subject. Um, you know, I think I have a unique perspective on some of these things as someone who served 20 years ago. Um, one of the last councils before strong mayor and also worked on that original charter and also was a very different person 20 years ago because I think some of my conversation is gonna be overarching on all this, which is important, how we get people of different uh, economic structures involved in the process. I can honestly say 20 years ago, I was in a very different position as a council person. I did not, I did not have the type of freedom that I have now. So I kind of I kind of want to start with the budget, which majority of leader, you know, touched on the budget process is a is a difficult process at best. And certainly we have expertise in the city. And, you know, I've learned a lot over the years, but it is a short time frame. And if we're thinking about to my colleague, uh, Councilman Mictum's uh, point, you know, getting people who aren't working you know, I see a few attorneys on council. I see people who work in different organizations, myself running a nonprofit. If we want to get people who are not doing that kind of work, the time frame that budget is done, it would be impossible. And I can hardly, I don't know, it's like a dream for me, I guess, 20 years ago, because I really hardly remember it. But I do know if there was something we could look at to extend that time frame, the, the also when we do the budget and to people who are familiar with it, doing it the way we do it in such a short time frame, really having so many things in one evening, that's not the best way to do it either. When you're having major departments like maybe fire and public works on the same night, that's not productive. That's not productive for us. That's not productive for them. And it just should be done in a better way. So I think 
it's twofold. It's important to extend it, but if we're really looking to, and I think we should, increase how people from different walks of life can participate in this process and be elected, that's a whole thing that would discount people. And I really think it's important. I, I've heard a couple people say, well, the mayor here, or, you know, um, I wouldn't get elected because so-and-so lives around the corner from me. When we're looking at this, it's about none of us. It's about who will come. You know, things are always built for the next people. So we should take all of uh, all of us out of the formula, um, even though I hope all of us are around for a long time, because it really is built on for who's next. Any, because if we build it thinking about people who are presently here, we're doing ourselves a disservice. That brings me to staffing. And it's funny, when Councilwoman Hercules brought up the full time, I was actually thinking of it in reverse. Even, even though I presently have a, a part-time staff person, I have someone who only works 20 hours for me, but we're in a unique position. She worked for me 20 years ago. She doesn't want to work full time. We have a pretty good rapport. We have the same committee we had 20 years ago. So I think, and certainly my colleagues are helpful. But with that said, again, I'm gonna go back to what we were saying. If you really had someone who didn't have a job like mine, who wasn't you know, Councilwoman Hercules, who wasn't Councilman Gale, you need somebody full time. There's a difference between the, uh, how long the, the full-time, part-time staff person and professionalism, those are two different things. But if you really wanna encourage um, other kinds of people to participate, they really need someone who can almost be there for them um, when they're working. And maybe I know my 20 years ago, I couldn't get phone calls at work. I couldn't leave during the day. I couldn't attend a meeting. You know, those were the kind of things. That's what I worked under. And I had a count. I had an assistant who was able, that was her full-time job. And, or if it was a man to be able to do those things, they were extension of, of myself. So I think that's, I think you can think about it both ways. Um, districts, you know, I'm not, you, you guys, I sit here and I'm in awe and humbled. You're all so smart. And I sit here and I'm like, I don't know what everybody's talking about. But I do know that we often, maybe not um, technically, but we often operate like we're with districts already. Um, I know one of my colleagues mentioned, I forget who said it now, that, you know, some neighborhoods are underrepresented. That is so, but also some neighborhoods we're elected at large and we don't always act like that. So we need to choose what we're gonna be. We need to choose what we're gonna be. Um, so I don't really have an uh, opinion one way or the other because I think I've heard so many very intelligent, you know, um, it's almost like uh, way out of my um, whatever, you know, whether it's, you know, three of this, five of that, how the minority works, um, but, but what I think we need to look at is, are we gonna be at large people or are we gonna be districts? And I think now we, we operate like we are elected by districts. So um, I was personally 20 years ago in favor of districts. I don't know it as in depth as everyone does, but I, but I, um, I, I, I think it's important. Um, oh, do I have anything else in my little notes here? No, I don't think I do. That's, that's my, that's my, that's my spiel. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Commissioner Medina, you have the floor. Well, thank you to the Councilwoman. I just, for a point of clarification, are you in favor of uh, a full-time staff supporting the council with a part-time council or vice versa? I, I would think if we leave it as a part-time council and I, and I, from what I'm hearing that a uh, full-time council is probably not gonna happen whether immediately or down the road. But if you were gonna leave it a part-time council that, and if you want to encourage people who don't have jobs like Councilman McJums or Councilman Hercules or myself, you somebody needs somebody who's there full-time. Somebody needs someone who can attend meetings. Cause as I said, 20 years ago, I couldn't leave my job to go to a meeting, take a phone call, do those kind of things. So um, if it's a, a part-time council position, I still think it needs a full-time person, particularly if you don't have a kind of job that uh, avails flexibility. 
I mean, I'm in the position that my job avails flexibility. So I have a part-time person, but that's not going to always work, even for someone whose job avails flexibility. So there you go. Thank you. That, that's helpful. And then um, uh, breaking that part down a little bit, one of the things that we've talked, I think, in past meetings is the difference between staff supporting a council within an executive assistant role or something similar um, uh, versus trying to provide the council with professional staff to engage in the really complicated budgeting processes, for example, so that the council is not always relying on the mayor staff. Do you lean in any direction, whether it be the kind of staff that the council currently has and moving towards um, a system in which we're, we're providing uh, part-time council members with a professionalized staff to allow, to give them the independence to engage in complicated policy and budgetary matters? Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a, uh, um, first of all, I would think anybody would hire someone who's competent. Um, are they going to be an expertise in everything? No. And do we rely on, I mean, the mayor's staff, the city staff, it's the staff that we rely on in the, in the budget department or in other departments. And I think that's who we should, who we should rely on. But would you want to hire someone who maybe has an expertise in a certain area if that's really something you're interested in? Yes. But I do think for what the position is, that the standards for someone who should be hired, you should be hired someone who can do all the things you would need someone to do. And that really is up to the individual council person. Can that process be changed? Yeah, absolutely. Those are my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gallon clark Thank you, Chair. For you, Councilwoman Rosetti. I'm just curious to know your response as far as the city council. Do you believe that the city council needs more voice or more autonomy as far as selecting commissioners? To any commission? Any commission. Um, you know, I didn't, until we started talking about this a couple of weeks ago, I've always thought that people were asked for their opinion in um, selecting people. And I know personally, I've brought people forth without difficulty, but that may not be so. So if that is so, then we should have more of a voice in it. But I think doing it, getting the people to do it, and you, Commissioner, you know that as well as I do. First of all, you've got to get the people to do it. You've got to get people who want to spend the time, put their names out there, uh, oftentimes be either criticized or, or not. But I've, I've always felt when names were brought forth, they were, they were looked at in a, 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 you know, in a way that wasn't, um, you know, even before I was on council. So is there probably a better way you can do it? Yes. But I think getting people to do it is even the more difficult part. How do you get people to know how gratifying it can be, you know, why it's important to do it. Um, you know, sometimes like the charter commission, it's, it's not a long-term um, involvement, but it's uh, but it results in changing the face of your city. So maybe it's more that part of it than um, uh, that the actual part that you asked me about. Does that make sense to you, commissioner? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to thank you, Councilwoman Rossetti, Councilwoman Mictum, Councilwoman Hercules, Councilman Gale, uh, Majority Leader Clark, uh, all for coming this evening. Uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate your insights and uh, coming to yet another meeting um, this week uh, in your busy schedule and weighing in. Um, and we will be in touch about uh, ways to participate in the next meeting. We hope you'll you'll join and um, you know watch that meeting and uh, uh, listen to what the folks from the other communities have to say about how things work in those communities. Um, so thank you again, and um, we appreciate your time. Thank you. First. All right. We will now move on to item number five, which is action item number three, boards and commissions. Um, and as I, I, I've mentioned um, tonight, the, the boards and commissions section is pretty extensive. There are many issues in the boards and commissions 
chapter that we have not um, figured out, but there are uh, some that we're hoping that we can come to consensus on tonight. Um, we have some technical um, issues that um, we can get out of the way, um, some issues with accessibility, diversity, um, and then opportunities to increase engagement and involvement um, in the boards and commission process. Um, and that's the language that, that was put forward to you all uh, as an action item. Um, so I'm gonna have uh, Steve walk us through the proposed action item. Um, and then uh, if there are no issues, you know, entertain a motion. So Steve, feel free to- Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we walked through this in early January. I'll go through it pretty quickly. And what I'll try to do is I'll try to identify the, the areas that you're still, um, you still need to debate um, so that uh, at least we can take care of the body of the document and leave two or three or four items um, out. As I said, on page one, section one, uh, we talk about the role of boards and commissions. We talk about um, the public interest being the sine qua non for uh, representation and participation. Um, we break down the boards and commissions so the public can take a look at the charter and understand that there are some boards that serve regulatory functions, planning and zoning commission, for example, and others that are department-based uh, policy and administrative functions. Um, again, uh, subsection B deals with a lot of the structural requirements, um, number of members, terms, chairs and other officers, uh, what constitutes a quorum. Uh, we have a section on a meeting frequency to make sure the boards and commissions meet on a regular basis. Uh, one of the outstanding issues that I, I still want you to think about is we haven't finalized it. And we'll, uh, I'll ask, we'll set it aside as a, an independent issue that needs to be resolved is the sunset provision, which originally came up in a conversation with the town clerk um, for those boards and commissions that do not operate um, on a regular basis. How do we sunset them? Is there an automatic sunset or would there be a five year consideration by the town council, by the city council to take a look at them? Um, what's important in this section, subsection eight uh, addresses issues of public access, uh, remote and direct access to make sure that um, our meetings for boards and commissions are taking full advantage of remote, um, remote communications, digital and electronic communications. Uh, wanna make sure that public comment is protected uh, at these meetings uh, prior to and during meetings. Um, uh, again, putting a caveat in there for executive session and other legal, legal or regulatory proceedings. Um, I thought it was important, my experience around the state has been, if you don't mention it, even though the freedom of information law deals with executive sessions, um, people look at an open meeting policy and a charter, well, there's nothing about executive sessions and therefore I thought it was important to put in to the charter the, the possibility that there would be executive session. Um, reiteration of minority party rep representation. Uh, the council member talked about uh, a stricter standard and if we go in that direction, this section would have to be looked at, but this is the typical um, uh, requirement for um, minority party representation, which I think I pointed out is a misnomer, but we'll talk about that uh, uh, at some later point. Uh, there's the an amendment to the compensation prohibition uh, to allow for reimbursement for expenses related to service, including transportation, child care, and other services that will facilitate uh, diverse participation of the electors of the city. I forget which member um, advanced that, but uh, that language was included in there. Um, it, it's consistent with um, the opinions we've heard tonight about broader participation in um, the um, uh, commissions of the city, including the city council. Um, the next section is up in the air. This is the appointment section. This is the issue uh, that be addressed in terms of uh, how we um, how we how we go how we move forward. One thing I point out if it's if it's okay, Mr. Chair, because it came up tonight um, in the uh, present by council members, uh, a number of the mem a number of the commissions that were mentioned this evening uh, were not in the charter, and so I want to just bring everybody's attention to the fact that there are charter commissions specifically referenced, 
and you probably should look at each of those. I think I've said this before, and I think we've talked about this before, uh, to see if any of them fall into categories. I think one of them already uh, has multiple appointing authorities. Um, and then the issue becomes whether you want to grant a general authority to the council um, to have different appointment modalities so that uh, uh, a number of the commissions that uh, the majority leader raised this evening are, are ordinance-based um, commissions. I think one of them is a resolution-based commission, uh, which I think will probably be converted into an ordinance, um, although we may deal with it in the charter as well. Uh, but uh, um, so we might think about that um, as opposed to mandating uh, those specific bodies, leave it to the council to mandate it, but give them the authority to do it, uh, so they could do it on on their own on their own level. So uh, I just wanted to just stop there for a minute. Uh, but we're not changing the appointment procedures tonight. If you adopt this provision, uh, I've simply noted that it's something you will need to address. Um, the last section is dealing with vacancy. Um, and uh, the role of the city clerk. I've had extensive conversations, as I told you, uh, with the city clerk uh, regarding these provisions. Uh, and then also representation, dealing with diversity, backgrounds, um, very important provisions that don't exist in the charter right now um, that uh, really take a look at uh, the diversity of the community, not just race, uh, color, ethnicity, religion, creed, age, sex, but also socioeconomic data, um, sexual orientation, whole range of things, neighborhoods, where people come from, geographic representation. So it really establishes a mandate uh, for a mayor and a council, because whether you have appointment authority, you still have advice and consent one way or the other. And, and so um, that's where you would exercise, your, the council would exercise its authority on diversity uh, by looking at what kind of people the mayor is, in fact, appointing to boards and commissions. Uh, this establishes a pretty clear standard. Uh, subparagraph H, required cooperation. This looks like a simple concept, and you may wonder why you'd put it in a charter, uh, but I, uh, I believe it's an important provision to have in a charter. Uh, when you have boards and commissions that have department responsibility, um, this is a provision that a member of that board or commission could look to, to say to the department head, you're not giving me the information, you have an obligation under the charter to do so. Uh, it could lead to an action by going to the council to try to invoke uh, that department head, asking the mayor to get the department head, but at least there's a constitutional standard that you could point to as a member of a board or commission that would um, allow for um, a required cooperation, which seems like a pretty basic thing, but it's not necessarily uh, a thing. One of the um, one of the speakers in two weeks, as I mentioned earlier, is the council president of Norwalk. And unlike New Haven, which has its own professional staff, Norwalk has staff appointed uh, or assigned to each of its committees by the administration, and. I think a good question to ask them, uh, uh, Tom next week, Tom Livingston next week, is do you ever run into a problem where you get a stonewall from your staff, uh, from the assigned staff? And one remedy I would have for something like that is a cooperation provision, uh, which would put that staff member in a, a position where they have to cooperate uh, with the council, particularly if they are assigned to the council. Um, so that's, I just wanted to point out the importance of that provision that seems relatively innocuous. Um, uh, administration, again, uh, this is a, um, a section that has been gone over very thoroughly with the city clerk, and the city clerk uh, se seems to be uh, interested in doing this, and I think you're very lucky to have a city clerk who is, because whether they're not, whether the, because the next city clerk will have to be. Uh, because I think it's important that with respect to boards and commissions that somebody be responsible um, uh, on a legal basis for keeping the books. Too many communities, big cities in the state, uh, have somebody who's worked there for 35 years or 50 years. Hartford had an outstanding uh, woman who, who kept track of all the boards, Linda Bear, who kept track of all the boards and commissions. I miss her because I used to deal with her 
uh, during my charters uh, in, in the old days. Uh, New Haven had uh, Patty Lawler. I mean, these women really, who worked for 50 years, they still call her, thank God she's around, um, because no one keeps track. This provision and other provisions I've designed is designed to institutionalize the keeping of those records. You shouldn't need to make it constitutional, but my experience is that you have to uh, in most of our cities here as well. And again, in this section, there's um, expanded outreach and public communication and notification of the public regarding vacancies. Uh, it requires the mayor and the city, city clerk to engage in outreach efforts. Um, let me just see, I think in the next sections, again, section two is where we talk about the charter-based commission's internal audit, which already has a diverse appointment procedure, the committee on abatement of taxes, the board of assessment appeals, planning and zoning, and zoning board of appeals. Those are the charter-based commissions uh, that we have here now. And uh, I think that's pretty, um, pretty much it. Uh, we have um, sections on, uh, you should disregard them because I think we've approved them already under, or actually, I'm sorry, they will be approved when we look at the treasurer section. The stuff that we're dealing with pension commission will be addressed when we get to the treasurer's um, action item. That's it for my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Do we have any questions from commissioners about that section or that chapter and the, the sections within that chapter that we would potentially be taking action on this evening? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Rubenstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, Attorney Mednick, uh, <clears throat> In the previous meeting, count, uh, Councillor uh, Rifkin mentioned about fixing the Internal Audit Commission, a commission that I uh, sit on by way of uh, disclosure. Uh, he mentioned that the appointment of uh, one of the commissioners through the top 10 taxpayers took an unduly long period of time and mentioned a uh, purported fix, and I believe I mentioned the purported fix that was uh, similar to what uh, attorney uh, Rifkin mentioned, which would be to have the chief auditor and the two remaining uh, commissioners seek notice, send notice out, gather um, applications, weed through the applications, select the best or most qualified three applications and submit them to council for them to pick out of the three, the most appropriate one to join uh, the other two commissioners. Is that in uh, uh, for action tonight? I do not have that for action. Um, I'd leave it to the chair whether he wants to entertain that as an amendment or whether you want to do further consideration of it. But um, it was not, I don't recall it coming up and, and it was not brought to my attention for drafting purposes. So um, I'll leave it to the chair to figure out how we should uh, address that issue. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Rubenstein, if we could uh, table that discussion to a, a later time, just because we, we aren't dealing with any other boards or commissions specifically, um, I'd like to have a conversation, you know, a, a global conversation about boards and commissions and how we're going to handle those uh, rather than uh, picking and choosing. I have no problem with that. Can we can we um, table it to the next meeting? Can that be part of the agenda for the next meeting? The, the uh, next meeting? Oh. Yeah, so the, the, next full. Meeting, <laughs> the next meeting is going to be uh, pretty chock-a-block full. We've got five, um, we've got five speakers from the uh, from outside of Hartford, and then we have a number of members of council that weren't able to make it tonight who will be presenting as well. Um, uh, Commissioner Kennedy uh, suggested at our last meeting that we set aside a significant amount of uh, an evening to discuss boards and commissions. Um, and because it is such a weighty topic, I tend to agree with that sentiment. And I'd like to ensure that we have 
a, a long enough period of time where we can have a full robust debate about yeah. all the issues before us. Um, so I don't, I don't foresee it being possible to, to do all of that at our next meeting, but um, we are on schedule right now um, to, to uh, keeping on schedule with what we have uh, proposed and we should have enough time to, uh, you know, cover all these issues. And, um, you know, if we, if we come to a point where we need to add in an additional meeting to, to, uh, to make up for that, um, we've considered that as well. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve um, the language and action item number one. Second. Action item no number, move. excuse me, action item number three. Was no seconded, move. seconded by Commissioner DeJesus and, or, made by Commissioner DeJesus, excuse me, and seconded by uh, Commissioner Rubenstein. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, uh, we'll go with the roll call vote. Commissioner DeJesus. Yes. Commissioner Gale. Commissioner Aponte. Yes. Commissioner Aralampolo. Yes. Commissioner Bonafonte. Yes. Commissioner Gallon Clark. Yes. Commissioner Harrington. Commissioner Kennedy. Yes. Commissioner Kowalshin. Commissioner Medina. Commissioner Jeter. Commissioner Rubenstein. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Wolf is a yes. And Commissioner Gale. Yes. Okay. The motion carries unanimously uh, 10 to 0 and passes. And we will now move on to action item number one, which are revisions to. Uh, the budget provisions, and again, I will pass it over to Steve to discuss those uh, minor revisions. <clears throat> Hand-eye coordination doesn't always work. No, I do my best uh, to find the mute button. Uh, there's not much uh, uh, in the way of change here. I'll, I'll go over them very quickly. Uh, these changes were generated by a very careful read by the chair. We find a found a typo, so uh, we probably didn't need to amend it with the typo, but I'll show you the typo. Um, and the um, finance office uh, came back with a couple of observations that we may I may have missed um, when we were drafting the original document. Um, the first one is in section two, C one, where we were requesting that the budget estimates for the uh, year include budget requests and, um, of each department for the next three fiscal years. Um, they wanted it simply for the fiscal year for administrative purposes. This is the way they've done it. And, uh, and then they suggested that they didn't see much value in expanding beyond the current fiscal year. That's different than capital budgets where you do look at multiple years um, and uh, and so that's the first change. Um, I, and um, the second change again is minor. This is the, uh, this is the typo um, in one of the shaded areas in subsection um, D, D um, nine, um, there's an amendment to uh, the council powers provision and the word standard should be standards. Again, um, I probably wouldn't have come back for the, uh, the change, but since we were making the change, I thought I'd point out that that was uh, the case. And then on the very next to last page of the, um, the ordinance of the, uh, the budget amendment in, in the monthly report section, subsection D, um, I had forgotten that we were deleting the comparable data report um, 
He is frankly, um, and I didn't know this because I, I discovered this, OPM, neither OPM nor CCM uh, provide uh, these kinds of reports on a regular basis. This data, unfortunately, is not available. Uh, there used to be an old organization called CPEC. CPEC did have the data, and I have this provision in a Waterbury charter, uh, and there's no successor for, for CPEC. I've talked to CCM about doing this. I think CCM should do it, or OPM should be doing it, but it's not here, and it, may, it makes no sense to put a provision in the charter that really has no basis for enforcement. So those are the three uh, changes um, that uh, are included in this modification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to entertain a motion to take action on this item. So move. So move. The motion was made by Commissioner DeJesus and seconded by Commissioner Rubenstein. Do we have any discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner DeJesus. Aye. Commissioner Gale. Aye. Commissioner Ponte. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Aralampalum. Aye. Commissioner Bonafonte. Yes. Commissioner Gallon Clark. Yes. Commissioner Kennedy. Yes. Commissioner Rubenstein. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Harrington, Commissioner Kowalshin, Commissioner Medina, Commissioner Rivera, Chair votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. Um, and we will now move on to item number seven, adjournment. Without objection, the meeting will stand adjourned to 831. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Good night.